My name is Tom Zara. I'm a executive director at Interbrand and lead the global uh, corporate citizenship practice at Interbrand. And um, I have to start by thanking Gary because um, on the one hand, he may be incredibly depressed and uh, realize that uh, the world that we live in uh, is the world that we've created. And <coughs> his message at the end was, uh, thank God, uplifting um, and optimistic because um, what we create is also what we can fix. And uh, the say-do gap that you talked about is, is something that we uh, spend an enormous amount of time examining in our uh, work that we do. Interbrand is um, here because we're the bridge between the sentiment in this room and the commercial world that is part of our lives. And we have this responsibility of helping our clients understand what I consider to be the consequences of prosperity, which is we live a quality of life that is the envy of 99.9% .9 of the world. And with that privilege and with that luck of who we are, um, there are responsibilities and consequences of our own prosperity that is reflected in, in some of the actions that we take in order to satisfy the demands that we create for the quality of life that we uh, so uniquely enjoy. So one of the things uh, we'll certainly talk about is uh, um, this issue of, of confusion in the marketplace about what sustainability is. One of the things that um, we will no doubt spend time on is understanding uh, what truth means, which I think is a really, really important question uh, to ask because um, as Gary said, words are important and I couldn't embrace that statement more enthusiastically. Um, but we're also incredibly clever. And um, how we tell stories and why we tell stories and um, what that narrative is that we create has to spring true uh, from something that is deeply authentic in who you are, uh, the values that you embrace, and how you want to affect behavior. Because at the end of the day, we live in a world of choice. And that choice is dictated by a behavior that we encourage and or reward others to take. So it is with that context that um, I want to sort of tee up the, the panel. Um, and uh, my job is really to keep the conversation going. Um, Gary was masterful in his allotted 45 minutes, um, but he's a bit selfish because he didn't allow you guys to participate. <laughs> um, we will. So uh, one of the things that we will do is spend some time um, talking about um, our businesses and, and how we manage the message um, in the context of the behaviors that we're trying to instill in uh, our customers and or our own organizations. Uh, but then I do want to let the, um, the floor participate. So we will build time into our panel to encourage um, the curiosity of, of the student and the wisdom of the uh, gray hairs in the room to participate uh, in a way to, A, increase the heat in this room. Uh, <laughs> and B, to discourage you from taking another break in the middle of our session. So um, <laughs> we'll go from there. I'll start um, by asking each of the panelists uh, to introduce themselves, uh, only because I would uh, butcher it, and, um, and they're much better at talking about themselves than I am about them. And if you would, just frame the, the business proposition, because at the end of the day, um, we have to understand what is the business that you're in, um, and why is that um, something that needs to be protected as an idea. And then um, we'll then 
volley back and forth on um, the role of storytelling and, and things of that nature. But I'd, I'd like us to appreciate kind of um, the organization that you've created, um, the nature of that business, and, and the mission and purpose of that business as a starting point. So we'll go from right, right. to left. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Anjali Kumar. I'm the general counsel and head of social innovation at Warby Parker. Um, how many of you wear glasses? <laughs> All right. How many of you have heard of Warby Parker? Awesome. Mm. That's great. All right. So Warby Parker is, I'm sorry? <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> One guy in the back. Thank you. My favorite person <laughs> in the room. Uh, well, hopefully the rest of you will be soon after this conversation. Uh, I'm not wearing them, so, you know, there it is. But Warby Parker is a lifestyle brand, and we sell prescription eyewear for $95. That includes the prescription, free shipping, free returns, and that's the basic story of the, of the company. Um, in addition, the sort of, you know, bleeding heart part of our story is that for every pair that we sell, we also distribute one to someone in need, and it's a little bit of a more nuanced story than just buy a pair, give a pair. Um, the idea is that we actually create a sustainable model from that, so we don't just give away the glasses. We work with a local nonprofit called Vision Spring, which will work in rural communities in India or, or in El Salvador and other countries in which they do their work to train local men, excuse me, local men and women to actually administer eye exams in their communities, which are often <coughs> filled with people um, earning less than a dollar a day, or four dollars a day, rather. And they will administer eye exams and then actually sell glasses within their community, so it creates a sustainable model. And so that's what we do in a nutshell. Great. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Maxine Veda. I'm the co-founder of a startup that launched um, August 27th called Zadie. Uh, we're a shopping and lifestyle destination for the conscious consumer. So for every product that we sell on Zadie.com, uh, you can get an in-depth story from the designer about both their inspiration but about the manufacturing process. Uh, for every product that we sell, we have kind of a visual nomenclature um, that kind of delineates what we find special about the product, whether it's something that's handmade, locally sourced, um, that is made here in the U.S. We're really trying to um, get people to understand the qualities that make up their products and get to know the people behind them. So it's definitely all about storytelling. 5% uh, of proceeds um, from Zadie go back to our nonprofit sister organization, the Bootstrap Project, which was really um, the heart of the creation of Zadie. And the Bootstrap Project works with artisans um, in the developing world to help them revive their craft traditions. And it was really our association, um, our being my, sorry, my co-founder and I, Soraya, our um, relationship with the Bootstrap Project and getting to know the artisans um, and really getting to know the artwork behind what they were doing and the appreciation of that, that kind of was the jump start for creating Zadie, which is just sort of a global platform um, for craftsmanship um, and really authentic brands around the world. Hi, I'm Josh. Um, I've spent the last 10 years on uh, several different ventures, all with a um, a theme of trying to figure out how to make, call it sustainable, green, less harmful products, um, widely appealing to wider audiences. Um, we talk a lot about taking things mainstream. I don't really know, that seems, like, again, like one of these general terms we talk about a lot that doesn't seem to have much meaning anymore, but, but that's the work I've focused on. And so I had started 10 years ago with a company called Vivavi that was a modern uh, sustainable furniture company. Uh, we repped about 80 designers from uh, the U.S. and around the world, and we're an e-commerce site and had showrooms in uh, Manhattan and Brooklyn. Um, and out of that, um, kind of the philosophy that uh, was guiding me um, was this thing called the lazy environmentalist, um, which I will just quickly tell you the story because it probably explains more to me than anything else I can tell you. Is when I had Vivavi, I had started in Washington D.C. and we were moving up to Brooklyn because in 2004, 2005, there was a fabulous uh, sustainable design scene emerging uh, in around Williamsburg and Greenpoint, um, Red Hook. So we were gonna go uh, get really close to those designers. 
we being me and um, my office manager and only employee, uh, Lucy. And so um, I am a lazy guy. And <laughs> on this last day that we were working together because she was not going to come to Brooklyn with me, um, I offered to give her my van that we would take to trade shows uh, if she would pack it up um, and drive it up to Brooklyn with me and unload it. Um, so she agreed, and so we had a really long day, and we were uh, on uh, I-95 or the Jersey Turnpike, I can't remember, it was about 10.30 at night, and Lucy started, um, it seemed like she was hyperventilating in the passenger seat, you know, she's kind of like, <gasps> <gasps> I said, Lucy, are you all right? She said, Josh, look, I have to ask you something, I have to get this off my chest, I couldn't ask you when you were my boss, but you're not my boss anymore, and I, there's just something I really need to know. And so I instantly thought, oh my God, she's attracted to me. <laughs> this, this, this is amazing, this is awesome. Um, she's right, I'm not her boss anymore. <laughs> and uh, I started thinking about the apartment that I was going to that I hadn't even seen in Brooklyn and I knew there was a roommate and what were the logistics and how is this gonna work out in like a flash, right? In like a second. So anyway, I said, no, 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 we can talk about it. It's okay, whatever you want to talk about. She said, oh, I don't know, I don't want you to take it the wrong way. I said, no, no, go ahead. You can say it. it's going to be fine. <laughs> She's like, okay, are you really an environmentalist? <laughs> so um, she went on to say, I mean, you're always in the shower. You barely recycle. You were going to take your, your, you were going to throw your bed out. I took it to the homeless shelter. Like, you're basically like the worst environmentalist I've ever seen. <laughs> you're running this company, and I just simply don't understand. Um, it's been on my mind for a year and a half since I've been working for you. Um, so uh, that night did not work out nearly how I thought it was going to <laughs> in that moment. And I wrote a blog entry called The Lazy Environmentalist. I was blogging a lot uh, on Vivavi. And I wrote basically the extent of, look, I get it. I think these, we have huge challenges. I think global warming's real. I think we have food issues, water issues, air issues, you name it. Um, but here's the reality. I take long showers because I do my best thinking in the shower. I don't really want to change that behavior. I would like someone to figure out how to make, you know, enable me to enjoy my shower, use less water, use less energy to heat that water, and if I can afford that solution, I'll buy it. But you know, I will just be straight up acknowledge I am an American, I live in a consumer culture, and I am part of that culture, so I need solutions that are really gonna work for me, and I suspect that there's probably lots of people who feel the same way. And so that um, blog led to uh, a journey that I hadn't anticipated where it turned into books and a radio show I had on Sirius and a TV show I hosted on Sundance Channel for a couple of years, and um, it was a great run. My most recent project was for the last two years I was working for a company called Quidzy, which is a subsidiary of Amazon. Uh, they own sites like diapers.com, soap.com, wag.com, and I was hired to develop and launch, um, again, a green product site uh, called vine.com. Um, sadly, we acquired that name from uh, Vine, the Twitter app, so we've had some uh, branding challenges there. Um, but it's been a really interesting ride, and I'd be happy to talk about that more. I'm Tasha Rudder, and I'm the Vice President of uh, Business Development at Feed. And we are a social business, a for-profit entity. Um, and our mission is to create good products that help feed the world. Uh, it was started seven years ago by Lauren Bush Lauren. Um, whenever she was a student, she was asked by the World Food Program to become their student ambassador. Um, so she traveled the world in South America, Africa, also throughout Asia, and really for the first time for herself even, she came face to face with the overwhelming issue of hunger and poverty that so many, 870 million people in this world face. Um, so her mandate whenever she came back was at her own school and in other schools to go and talk about hunger and poverty. Um, and to sort of enlighten people to this issue. However, she found herself a wonderful storyteller to people um, and to these students, and she had them engaged in those moments. However, how did she empower them and activate them at that point? Um, these kids, you know, these students at this stage in their life, they don't have a check book that they can, you know, whip out and write. Um, you know, for a big donation. A lot of them are going to go and volunteer in the Peace Corps. Um, so what could they do? Shopping. <laughs> um, she also was taking some design classes at this point, and so she just had the idea to create a consumer product 
um, that could be unisex and embraced by everybody. So she created the first feed one bag, which was inspired by the burlap uh, rice ration bags that she had been seeing on her trips. And the genius of it was to build the donation directly into the cost of the product. So for the first feed one bag, it actually feeds one child in school for one year. So essentially the consumer immediately becomes the donor whenever they are buying that product. Uh, so we're seven years later. We've expanded to over 70 different products now. We're working in many different countries also with artisans to create artisan products. And uh, just as a couple of weeks ago, we announced that we are now um, over 75 million meals given. So. Fantastic. So um, as the provocateur, um, I'm going to ask you to sort of tell the story. And, and I want, if you would, for all of our uh, benefit to um, appreciate two aspects of, of the story that you tell. One is um, you're all in business. Um, and you're not really interested in not making a profit because the profit is, in fact, the fuel for the purpose of the organization. So on the one hand, you got to seduce the marketplace into believing that um, there is a merit in the uh, value exchange of money for service. And that's a fairly logical, straightforward story of you have choices, this is our choice that we offer. The other part of the narrative is um, uh, creating a connection with the audience. Um, connecting them to um, the consequence of buying your product and the purpose of uh, why carrying that badge, the one person that has the, the Warby Parker glasses, is actually making a statement not only about you but about themselves. So help us appreciate how each of you um, determined what the narrative was for the business and the narrative that was to engage the marketplace. And um, a little anecdote about the story and would be helpful because I think at the end of the day, brands are about storytelling. And we all have them as it relates to um, the things that we have done and the things that we continue to do. So um, that I think that would be illuminating for all of us to sort of uh, work our way around, and I'll try to keep Josh down to a couple of minutes. Um, <laughs> but we'll um, we'll use that as sort of um, profiles of different narratives to appreciate a the diversity of the storytelling that is um, part of the sustainability story, part of the philanthropy story, part of the fixing the problems of the world um, that we all represent sitting at this table. So. We'll go with um, Anjala okay. um, first, and then we'll just work our way around the panel again. Sure. I, you know, I think what what's a little bit different about Warby and what I think is interesting about the Warby story is that um, we don't lead with that messaging, right? So it's we're a fashion brand. We're a lifestyle brand. The gentleman in the back, I'm sure, looks very handsome in his glasses, and you'll see that when you look at him. And that's what he cares about when he's buying glasses. He wants to know they look great on his face. And that they work, that he can see better, and that he can, you know, read his contracts or whatever he's doing. Contracts, that was my reference because I'm a lawyer, so, you know, I read my contracts with my glasses. But I think, you know, that's what you're worried about when you're buying glasses and you want to look cool and they're on your face. Um, the, the sustainable part of our business and the stories about the buy a pair, give a pair, and all that other stuff is really tertiary messaging for us. So it's infused into everything we do. It's just part of the DNA of the company. So we don't necessarily feel the need to kind of beat the drum on that. Um, it's And if people want to find that out, it's on our website. That information is out there. It's written about in the press here and there. And so that information is certainly available. I and mean, then we'll, you know, we'll probably have that messaging out there more. But I think our idea is really, at the end of the day, how can we transform the norm of what it means to do business, right? Like how can we show that you can do good in the world and also do well as a business? And that those things don't have to be separate ideas and that they don't have to live within a CSR function and marketing department. That our, you know, that our CSR is everything we do. It permeates absolutely everything. So it's, I mean, part of the reason this function sits with me is because we don't think of it as a marketing thing. Um, so we're not just trying to sell more product by saying, hey, if you buy these, then we'll also give them away. It's more just, it's just baked into everything. 
All right. I'll, I'll come back just so you're ready. Um, <laughs> on part of the, the process of validating the message and in your case, to, to what degree is the buy one, give one, which is not a new idea, and, and um, to what degree is that uh, something that um, is unique and or a model that others are going to follow and we're getting into a shared economy and the idea of changing the uh, construct of a business mm -hmm. um, is becoming a fundamental to a lot of the conversations that we're having in this sector of the business and so I, I do want to come back to a little bit about how you track and, and um, examine uh, the veracity of your of, of both the business model and the messaging that you're delivering to consumers. Maxine? So um, initially in launching the nonprofit, the Bootstrap Project, there was a lot of back and forth about what sort of model it would fit under. Would it be a nonprofit model or a for-profit model? And um, it really, you know, I was in law school at the time and like studying the different ways of going about um, doing business. And to me, it, it kind of ultimately it was hard for, I was so focused with the Bootstrap Project on working with the artisans, on making sure that they had everything they needed, um, it was important that it fell under a 501c3 structure, uh, that the focus could really be about the artisans and then kind of the after effect is the beautiful product at the end of the day. But when um, partnering with Soraya and we, you know, initially it was over the Bootstrap Project, she kept saying, you know, is this a for-profit or non-profit? Is it a for-profit or a non-profit? And kind of ultimately what we decided with Zadie was um, it's really about quality product wherever you find it around the world. Um, and so on the, the bootstrap project side of things, it's for artisans just starting out. But there's really beautiful product you can find that's made in the US, that's made in Peru, that's made in Germany, um, that doesn't require that the sort of um, scaling that the, artisans, that the artisans from the bootstrap project needed. Um, and so for us, the storytelling is, it's not, you know, kind of like Anjali, it's not about um, the do-gooder aspect. It's really about, you know, where, like, what is your product that you're buying? I mean, brands, you know, of the past have, have focused just on their logo, and that's really what's carried them. Um, and, and now we're kind of seeing a new generation of consumers that want to go deeper. They want to know, like, you've been stuffing this logo in front of my face, but what is it that I'm buying? And that's what really we're focusing on. So it's not about do-gooder per se, it's about buying something that's a piece of quality that they can know the history and heritage and they can feel like they're um, buying into something that they have an identity with each and every product that they're wearing. And so that's really what we focus on with Sadie. Uh, with Vine, when we launched, um, and the reason why I wanted to uh, come uh, do this with Quidzy was because Quidzy uh, started as diapers.com um, and grew very, very quickly to um, you know, uh, several hundred million dollars in, in revenue in just a few years um, and was focused, of course, on moms. And so there was great infrastructure in place. And um, my feeling at the time, having you know, um, uh, tried different ways to figure out how to you know, message, attract people to green products, what I would consider you know, better choices. Um, I felt it was really hard, and I felt that um, the market for it, um, I think, is kind of being echoed, at least when you think about, you know, maybe outside of f food and beverage, is um, it's really challenging to get people to, um, you know, buy and prioritize their purchases based on how they feel about, you know, sustainability or the environment or social causes, right? They care about their design. They care about certainly heritage. These other things that we're trying to get people to hook into. But with, with Vine, what we thought was, um, Great, let's go tell a story around health. Yes, these are all natural organic products. Yes, we're gonna sell organic bedding, we're gonna sell organic yoga apparel, we're gonna sell you know, FSC certified tables, we're gonna sell everything. You, know, you could call it a one-stop shop for green, but we're not gonna tell that story. We're gonna tell a story around these are healthy choices for you and your family um, because we have felt that it was um, self-interest very much drives this market, at least um, as a primary consideration, moms who want the best, healthiest choices for their families. Um, we happen to uh, target affluent, urban, educated customers. Um, so, you know, we have found that there's 
lots of moms who just say, I think as like Gary was saying, who look actually key in for whether it's pesticide free or no artificial preservatives or gluten free or organic or things they may or you know, certain things they really get and other things that are just like specific um, claims. Um, they look for that and they say, great, that's what I, that's what I want for my kids. I want the best choice. And when we launched Vine, we spent a lot of time thinking about this standard. How would we decide what was going to qualify for the site? Given that there really is no, you know, definitions are emerging and there's great initiatives underway across industries, but there is no definition of what's a green product that a consumer can rely on. So we just had to put a stake in the ground and say, here's what green furniture looks like to us. It's gonna, you know, we think it has to be 50%, at least 50%, sustainable materials, here's what that means to us, um, and that's what you're gonna find on this site. Here's what biodegradable means to us. It's different than what the government says it is because we don't think it's specific enough, and we have verified and vetted um, these claims from manufacturers um, to make sure that when we say something is, that, it, that they are behind that claim. We're not testing product, but that they themselves are behind that claim. Um, and of course, that's really important today as well when you think about the FCC and green guidelines and some of the the ways um, companies can go awry if they are not extremely specific in the claims they're making about their product. So we lead with that, and then we do as well try to tell a larger story about who the brands are, who the founders are, and connect people. Once we've acquired them, we try to you know, create that halo around the good that we're doing. The giving piece is obviously in the DNA of feed. Um, as you can see on our bags, <laughs> There's no denying that we have a mission that's very clear here. Um, so I wouldn't say that we necessarily lead with mission. It's really a one-two punch of mission is out there, but also we know that product has to be champion. We wouldn't be here seven years later if we hadn't continued to evolve with product development, respond to what our consumers wanted in that fashion space, and not just recreated the same burlap, ba burlap bag over and over again. However, that being said, it really, we have found from our consumers, it is a badge of honor that they wear their feed bag. They love that the logo is very big. They love that people ask them, what is this, uh, what is this bag? What is this story about? And they can say, I'm part of the solution. And then they turn the bag around, or the product around, and on every single piece, there's a number which signifies the amount of meals given or the amount um, of children who have been helped by this product. So it's very easy, it's very measurable, completely transparent and tangible for people to become the storytellers, for people to become the brand ambassadors for us. And this is something that has added value for them and shared value. And now we know with all of the millennial reports coming out, um, and a brand doing your own, um, that this is extremely important to consumers, but they also demand it and expect it of their brand. So it's not an afterthought, and it's something that will actually push them to buy a product over another one if quality and price are the same. So we definitely tell the story. Our consumers, our followers want to hear that story, and they want to have that experience of feeling like I'm doing something and I'm part of the solution. So let's spend a little time on on how you measure the impact of your storytelling. Um, there's uh, a prevalence of skepticism in the marketplace, and we're all slightly cynical one way or another. And so protecting the integrity of the message is, is part of the responsibility of, of the brand, and it's inherent in the stories that you tell. I am interested in sort of appreciating, one, the, the vehicle by which you deliver the message uh, and the story, and, and, and how you're ensuring that we're not just um, affected by our own sense of purpose and, and deluding ourselves into believing that we're actually accomplishing what we are. Yeah, sure, you have uh, weekly, daily, monthly sales that you track as one measurement of success, but I am interested in, in how do you determine that you've created this um, advocacy for the brand and that, and, and that and it is something that you can reflect on and, and, and leverage as you start to look at either product proliferation or product diversification or audience expansion. Um, share with us a little bit about um, the vehicle by which the, t the story is told, and then the, the techniques that you're using to ensure that um, you're getting the pulse of the marketplace accurately measured as you look at 
um, how to defend the brand and how to expand the brand. And anybody can jump in on that question. Um, for us, the messaging around our buy a pair, give a pair, a lot of that's done on the internet. So we are an e-commerce based brand. We now have four le retail locations as well, but largely a lot of our consumers interact with us on the web and so they that might be with the first place they've heard about the brand and they kind of interact with us there so there's messaging certainly within that um, space about the buy a pair give a pair and getting into more details if people want to know that information so there's a lot of things there um, the press has been inc incredibly incredibly kind to us so a lot of our story has been told by the press and talking about buy a pair give a pair and I think part of it is just on us to tell that story because it's not as simple as a one-for-one -one model where we're not just you know, giving one away. How do we tell that story um, in, in an authentic way and get people to, to understand what it actually means? Um, both Neil Blumenthal, who's one of the co-founders of Warby Parker, and myself have a long history in nonprofit, and we both really believe in that model of sustainable development. That's kind of where we were both born from, I guess, in terms of our nonprofit background. So it's something that's very authentic to us, and it's something very authentic to the brand. So again, it wasn't something that was an add on, like, oh, let's also do this. It was always part of the, the way the company was set up because Neil came from Vision Spring, which is now one of our key partners in doing the work. So in terms of how we hold ourselves accountable, it's through Vision Spring, through CES, you know, through our partners. Um, we make glasses really well. That's what we do. They do incredible work in the vision space and in the eye care space and in terms of giving glasses away. So we partner with the best to do that work. So we're not trying to reinvent the wheel and say, okay, we're going to go out and do all this stuff because we know how to do that. That would be a big distraction from what we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. And so we're really focusing on making the gl best glasses we can, telling the story about those glasses and selling a lot of glasses, hopefully, and then you know, putting, putting the onus, I guess, on our nonprofit partners to give those away and to distribute those in a responsible way. And so we're, that's how we've been accountable, I guess. So the, um, I'd like to come back to that because the, this, these, your organizations do not do all the lifting alone. No. And uh, how you determine what the right partnership is, um, how you hold them accountable for um, delivering on the promises that you make and the stories that the brand tells is an important part of um, executing effectively and having the kind of um, outcomes and income impact because um, in a sense you're delivering health care. Um, and with that is a huge responsibility. Absolutely. I mean, I think just one point I'll make on that is that we would never want our success to put pressure on our nonprofit partners to scale at a, at a rate that's not comfortable for them. Yeah. So we're, we're very lucky to have the sort of unprecedented success that none of us anticipated in such a short time. Um, and we want to commit and continue to commit to the buy a pair, give a pair model but I also don't want us to be trapped by that messaging where we start doing it in, in a somewhat irresponsible way. So I would rather have us take the time and have to explain ourselves and say, well, yeah, we've sold X you know, number of pairs and we've only given away X minus Y. There's a delta there. And the reason we haven't given those away is because we're still you know, waiting for the right partners to help us distribute the rest of those. That hasn't been the case to date, but I can imagine at some point soon we will outpace the capacity of our nonprofits. It's sort of a luxury problem to have on our side, but it is something that we think about a lot, and it's definitely something that, you know, I personally feel very challenged by is how do we continue to scale with integrity as Warby Parker, and then how do we continue to scale the impact we're having in the world in a responsible way? Yeah. So it's an interesting challenge that I think we'll face soon. We face the same at Feed. Um, we are only 10 people strong uh, in our office here in New York, and so it is imperative for us to partner with some of the larger giving organizations to be our donor partners. So we have the World Food Program, UNICEF, and Feeding America here um, that we mostly work with. Um, there are sort of there are some smaller um, organizations like DonorsChoose.org that we have activated certain programs with, but that for us is key because we need that transparency um, and, of course, everything that goes with that auditing processes. And you were speaking about the <clears throat> the messaging that we do, and um, the kind of the most exciting part of 
uh, Buildings AD so far has been really building the brand along with the community. Uh, in the few couple of months that we've been live, um, we have a community of over 100,000 people um, across social media. And the exciting part is to, um, we have a, a feature section uh, where we have journalists write articles that are not pushing product at all. It's really just about the Zadie lifestyle. And we had one article, um, Breaking Down Your Closet in Terms of Cost Per Wear. Uh, and it's something that you know we all did as a, um, as a team and something that felt really natural to us. And it was just so cool to see how this article got picked up and the conversation it started um, on Facebook, on Twitter, on Google+. Um, really people interested and excited about this idea. And so that to us, um, yeah, sales have been excellent and you know far beyond our expectations, but um, those articles and, and the response from the community that it's not just something like we want it to be real um, and we hope that people follow, but that the like people right now are engaged and interested and they're at this stage where it's been fast fashion for two decades and they're kind of over it. Um, they see that it's, you know, it feels cheap in the beginning, but it's actually quite costly to have a fast fashion lifestyle where things fall apart after a couple of washes and you keep having to go buy things. Um, so that's been something that's really exciting for us to just see the response from the community, you know, really around the world of people interested and engaged with this subject and really wanting to see change. Uh, f for us, for Vine, um you know, we, as an e-commerce site, we do measure everything, right? So we test messaging. Um, we haven't come up with anything quite like the Applegate commercial. Uh, <laughs> but, um, you know, thinking about our target audience, um, you know, we did a campaign around um, Goodnight Kisses Paraben Free. And it just went uh, crazy, you know? It just hit, and, and um, because it hit on this fantastic emotional chord for moms around something they got, and it was just you know instantaneously like you know pithy, emotional, um, and uh, you know it drove a lot of click through, a lot of you know um, conversion, um, strong repeat behavior from customers uh, on messages like that. Some of ours bombed, um, but we use all the tools that are available when you think about you know Google or social media, and I do think it's still really hard to crack. And being part of Quidzy, there's ten sites. And what I've tried to figure out is like WAG, you know, our pet site, you know, they put on Facebook uh, something like, you know, if pets aren't in heaven, I'm not going, right? And like a thousand people share that like immediately, you know? Um, and it's just very hard to like key into those kinds of things. It, I, I think it's part of the ongoing challenge to, to figure that piece out, you know, how you really tell that story in a way that resonates with the channels that we need to be marketing in. So a theme that's, that's consistent across all four of your businesses is this A, need to connect, uh, B, to invite a conversation. Um, and inherent in the definition of a conversation, this is a two-way dialogue. And you, know, you have 10 people. Um, what's the ability and how do you um, respect the initiatives that you create in starting a dialogue with the brand, the responses that no doubt they incite, and then the ability to continue to um, parlay back and forth because um, while we have the technology to deliver and receive, somebody has to be able to participate that is more than just a robot. And, and how do you um, ensure that the ability of the brand and the organization to sustain the conversation and to create um, a meaningful connection between, um, you know, the devoted ones that, that Gary talked about, people who are incredibly uh, committed and passionate and, and they don't want to just be talked to, they want to actually engage with and interested in how you're, you're managing that and clearly your size permits that, and we'll talk a little bit about how ambitious you really are and how big is big, but I am, I am um, um, interested in appreciating um, how you uh, keep the conversation real, 
and what is the kind of the frequency of, of exchange that you're having as a brand with the, with the customers that you have? So um, I can take a stab at this one. We see the communication um, with our customers as central to what we're doing. Um, it is not a role that is given to an intern. It is not a role given to one person. Um, we all, every single one of us on the team of seven participate uh, in responding to, it's not our customers, it's our community. Um, and, and that the, differ the difference between seeing the people that you know, we interact with as our community versus our customers is huge. Um, and so it's time consuming, obviously. It is time consuming to respond to emails, to Twitter, to Facebook, but it is so important to what we're doing, especially at this stage in our company. Um, so we think it's time um, investment well spent. Uh, and we're seeing sort, you know, the, the earliest payoff in those people really becoming the ambassadors of the brand um, and getting that you know, personal connection. For example, uh, we write, um, handwritten thank you notes um, in all of our packaging and it was something that we really wanted to do um, but didn't realize it would actually have a marketing benefit in that um, taking Instagram pictures of the packaging has become a thing um, for our brand and that's great that's just that's free marketing for us um, and so I think you know people are people out there really want to engage and want to have that experience and we want it to be an authentic one and building an authentic brand is so important that it that it's just worth the time. Yeah, I would echo that. I mean, I think the key word is authenticity. For us, it's all been uh, very authentic. It's been very organic, um, chemical-free, pesticide-free. It's been very, very organic for us. Our customer experience team is incredible, and they interact you know, on behalf. A lot of people, the interaction that they have with our brand is through customer experience. And so that experience um, just completely connects people to our brand in a really deep way. I was a fan of the brand long before I started working for the brand, so I think it worked on me. It was a great recruiting tool for a lot of people, too. But it's definitely, our social media team is extraordinary. But again, it's very authentic. The way they're responding is the way they would want to be responded to. And so it, it doesn't just come off as authentic, it actually is. And there's things like we've had similar experiences of, you know, we started, people would ask us questions, customer service questions, through things like Twitter. And because we couldn't respond um, you know, fully in 140 characters, one of the customer experience associates started making little videos just to respond to the questions. She would tweet the link back and just make a little video. And people started sharing these videos, and they were getting hundreds of views on YouTube. It was so odd because it was just, it was like the equivalent of forwarding a customer service email onto like 100 <laughs> of your friends. Like, that's kind of weird, but people were doing it. And I think it's just because they were so surprised by that interaction and so you know, taken with it that they were sharing it with their friends. So things like that, that again, came from an, a very authentic place on our side, um, have had incredible effects of connecting people to our brand. And social media is huge for us. I mean, people really interact with our brand through things like Twitter all the time, and it's, um, it's fun for us too. Yeah, I mean, I would add that, I mean, what you're talking about is something that it's not a question for sustainable brands, right? It's a question for every brand, mm -hmm. right? How are you going to engage in your dialogue? But if, if you're asking about how are you going to engage in your dialogue around sustainability, right? Like, how do you make sure that that piece is percolating through these channels? Um, we still look to tools that, you know, the best brands in the world use. And we haven't been able to um, adopt all of them yet. But, you know, I'm hardened by the fact that I see such talented people who weren't necessarily, didn't necessarily grow up, um, you know, in brands that were born natural or born green, but are increasingly gravitating into this industry, who bring just fabulous backgrounds, um, who just up the game for, you know, for these kinds of brands. Uh, lots of people think, for example, that, and, and we've had to try to change this mentality too. If you like, if you get someone to like you on Facebook, you're done. Right, that's the funnel. They liked you, you can message to them, and now they're gonna convert to a customer. And it, the world just simply doesn't work that yeah, way. Yeah, like doesn't mean love. <laughs> yeah, not even, right? But yet you have brands like, you know, you look at the tools that like a Sephora is using or a Home Depot around creating community on their own sites. I mean, community. And seeing Facebook as the top of the funnel that drives people to community on their sites, and then eventually, somewhere down the road, to becoming a customer once they're bought into the fact that, wow, Sephora helped me figure out so much. I love this, I'm gonna buy something here. 
Yeah. You know? And I just think that there is a, you know, um, we're trying to figure this stuff out. And I think the faster that we can you know, continue to adopt these kinds of tools that are out there in cutting edge marketing, you know, the better. Feeds consumers are extremely engaged, and we almost think of them as team members um, because, you know, from a we tell, story tell mostly online and through social media, we've been lucky enough also to secure large partnerships with being a small team, being a social business where we give a large part of our profits away, we don't have the huge media budgets. So whenever we partner with somebody like Target, which we did this past summer, and we're able to eventually give away 14 million meals in America, but also have this huge platform where we finally have TV commercials, we have print ads that are in all of the magazines across from lifestyle to business, and a lot of press coverage. Um, that amplifies the story for us and then drives people back to the website where we really do tell the stories. Um, but you know, our customers are the ones asking us for tech, asking us for diaper bags, and that really does direct. We are extremely responsive to that. Um, and then they also are asking a lot of questions about the transparency of where their money is going, how these meals are being given, why they're being giving, given, what's happening in certain countries. So we really have a very large story to tell um, from a product point of view and from the giving um, side of it, but our consumers really can't get enough. I would just say, I think the one thing, like the magic of a feed is like, um, it's the same magic as um, this guy Mark Spellman once said about a magazine called Plenty, it was that, when he was talking about the Prius, he was like, you rarely ever do you see a bumper no. sticker on a Prius because the Prius is the bumper sticker, yeah. right? And feed is the bumper sticker, right? It has this fashion element, it's very on trend, and it is, it just says your values, states your values. And that is, um, that is like the really hard place to get to. That is the brilliant place to get to. And brands, I think, that figure at Tesla, you know, over will, you know, I mean, hopefully continue to get there, right? But we'll see. But there's just not a lot of brands that, you know, Patagonia, you know, in a sense, is that kind of brand. You're like wearing your values um, in a hip, cool way. And that's just, uh, that's magic. That's really hard to do. To make it a bite sized solution for people where it's easily understandable, you're, not having to get up on a panel or write a you know five-page email um, to somebody. That's extremely important because, as we all know, the attention spans are diminishing. Um, so for us to be able to say, feed, create good products that feed the world, one child is being fed for um, in school for one year, or 100 meals are being given, that has really been the key to our success. So, and, and Gary talked about this as well. I mean, he's a niche business, and and that protects. I think in a sense, um, A, uh, the integrity of the brand, and B, the complexity of, mm -hmm. of the idea of the brand. It just isn't something that is going to be mass marketed. And, and you have uh, the intimacy and you have the passion of the founder and the visibility of the founder and you have uh, the culture that you've created as an organization that ensures every single person is um, shares in the responsibility of building the brand and making sure the narrative is protected and that the narrative is consistent and that um, you can um, go to bed at night feeling good about what you've accomplished with this brand. That's one reality and what you share is the, the intimacy of managing the business. Um, my question to you guys is, you know, what is your ambition? What is niche good enough? Because it's one thing to consider, A, your point of view, and B, um, how you designed a responsible business, um, but you're tiny, and yet your purpose is magnificently large. So I, I'm just, want to understand a little bit better what does this look like for you in 10 years and um, and what does success really how does success sound and what does success really look like for you guys success for feed would be that you know in five years ten years somebody logs on and there's a holding page that says fed <laughs> that there is no more world hunger um, 
that's a lofty goal. So in the meantime, we're all very, very passionate about our mission of providing meals and feeding children. However, it's an even bigger idea and we're more excited about people embracing conscious consumerism as a lifestyle and as something that it's not niche. It's a given that they can go to a store and there's always an option in clothing, in apparel, uh, sorry, apparel, in accessories, food, home. Um, it's never a sacrifice because the product is always going to be just as good as you know something else that isn't a give back brand, but also that it's easily, um, um, easily accessible. So it's not that you're just having to go onto the feed website. We're building out so targets are going to be carrying it. You know, Saks Fifth Avenue is carrying it. We have a lot of retailers that we work with, but we want this to always be an option that is easily accessible. Um, and that people don't have to choose one or the other. That's, that's the goal to get to that point. I think we would share a lot of what you, what you said. I mean, first of all, I'd love to see a website that said fed. That would be amazing. <laughs> um, I think for the, you know, for the billion people out there in the world that don't have access to glasses, that's a statistic that makes absolutely no sense to me. Again, it's a very low cost poverty alleviation tool. It's a problem that can be solved, and I would love to see us make a significant dent in that problem. It's a distribution challenge, and I would love for us to be able to help that. Um, so there's certainly, you know, everyone's seeing or something, you know, that would be yeah. amazing too. Um, that certainly, you know, for our, for our own company ambitions, I think we, we have ground ambitions. You know, we're a lifestyle brand. We're hoping to, uh, to continue to grow. Um, so that's, you know, there's certainly grand ambitions there, but I think on the, again, on the, the sort of do good side, I would love for us to be a ubiquitous concept, you know, for this not to be like, oh, the Warby Parker of socks and the Warby Parker of this and the Warby Parker of that. I would love for it just to be a given that that's, that companies do good in the world as well as doing well. And I would love to see us for my own, again, personal challenge, us to redefine what it means to be the Warby Parker of something. Because right now, it's a very simplistic view of, you know, if you're the Warby Parker of blank, it means you have some sort of buy a pair, give a pair or something baked into your business model. And I would love to challenge what it means to do that and for it to be a grander ambition of the Warby Parker of blank means mm -hmm. all these other things mm -hmm. too. And it's definitely an education process, but over really the past two years, we've been really, really excited to fe at Feed to see in the retailers that we do work with, we are now in the handbag section. We're in the fashion section. We're not in the give back section. So people are starting to respond to this and saying, hey, it's just a great product. And on top of that, millennials, um, our customers are demanding. And so this is gonna shine above the others because there is added value there. Well, um, we see a lot of parallels to what is happening in the, in the food industry, in the food market, um, to what we're doing with Zadie. And, um, you know, if you look at the tra tra trajectory of organic food, uh, it was seen as very niche. Um, it was, you know, only in natural foods markets, which uh, growing up in Minneapolis, I don't recall ever seeing. Um, and then, you know, Whole Foods really popularized uh, what it meant to carry organic food and really elevated it not to just um, a niche, but to a real sort of luxury experience. Um, and now, kind of the biggest mass you can think of, Walmart carries organic food. Uh, and so it was really what started out as something very niche has gone really mass, and that's the trajectory that we see um, with the apparel industry is starting off something quite niche, but people then really expecting that in the clothing that they buy, um, demanding it, and it would be really great um, you know, for any one of our brands to be seen on that sort of mass scale. So. That's the kind of path that we would, we would like to take. Uh, we have a pop-up shop in LaGuardia that just opened earlier this month. That's our first sort of foray into brick and mortar, um, and we'd really love to continue um, down that brick and mortar path. Uh, we see ourselves as really an omni-channel company, uh, getting really the great detailed storytelling that you can do online, but then that really nice touch and feel experience that you can do offline. So mm -hmm. we have, we've got grand plans. I think if it were uh, Vine, what we would say is we have to figure out, okay, we're going down this path of natural and organic. Um, there may be opportunities, you know, Amazon is already into, uh, you know, fresh delivery of grocery. Maybe, you know, we hook into that too. But how do we carve off, um, you know, how do we serve moms so well that we can actually grow a really big business 
when uh, everyone else comes online, mm -hmm. right? When Whole Foods or Trader Joe's or whoever it is comes online as well, what have you carved off? And so there's a, a map, you know, uh, like probably every other e-commerce retailer, we would talk about personalization and getting people to, you know, uh, have kind of sunk costs in terms of information they've entered and sites that kind of reorganize around a mom who comes and says, oh, you're shopping for Timmy and we know he's gluten free and you know, he can't eat you know, peanuts and so here's your selection, right? That's like the vision and you could put any number you want on that in terms of what success might look like. Um, uh, the, you know, any revenue target. But I think when I, when I step back and I think about what, you know, what has mattered to me, uh, I also feel like, you know, the question comes up like, man, okay, you're just helping people, you know, like you're talking about these green products, but like, you know, like the world is like, we're facing a crisis and you're talking about like, you know, a shower head. Like it doesn't equate, you know? And I've also felt like, but this is where the dialogue is today in America. Like it's just very hard to move that other dialogue. Here's where we are. Um, so let's try to, you know, seed these choices into a marketplace, grow consciousness. I mean, it is that kind of, pokiness a little bit. But I do feel as well that I would say that it, beyond simply a revenue number, you know, I think we take great pride in saying we are helping hundreds of other small companies grow, right? And so it's not just about the end of the day solving the big giant, you know, problem, but it's also about enabling lots and lots of people to actually therefore be employed in jobs that um, align with their values. So there's so much benefit to be had by going down this path, and we try to focus and remind ourselves of all of that because I think that's how we measure success. Yeah, I mean, we, we've talked a lot about community here. I would dare say that you probably all share the same consumer, uh, that they're actually buying all of your products, um, and therefore you're a connected community, mm -hmm. and how that um, then changes consciousness, because I do think Josh, at the end of the day, there, you have to change your orientation in order to have a different conversation. Yes. And until you um, bring the science of the impact of what we have done to this earth and what um, we have accepted as being norm and choosing to reject that uh, forces us to have a different consciousness about who we are and our role in this world. And until that happens, all it is is going to be noise for most people. Um, we have about 10, 15 minutes left, um, I think. Um, and we now invite anyone in the audience to ask anybody on the panel a question. Some countries have more appeal to the typical consumer as opposed to other countries. Mm -hmm. For example, high need areas in the Horn of Africa and the Sahel, uh, most American consumers are not thinking about let's help children in Somalia right. or in Niger or Burkina Faso, which are high need areas. They're thinking about countries they know about. I'm just wondering how that factors into it and how you both meet the highest need and also make sure you're, you're running a business that has, sure. that works. Sure, so thank you. Well, at Feed, because we do engage these on the ground giving partners, um, the example of working with the WFP, they give to 62 of the poorest countries in the world through the school feeding program that we are participating in. So usually we don't earmark it really is where the greatest need is at that time. Um, so that is sort of you know, how we, we usually deal with that. However, we have created certain product lines like our Feed Kenya product line, which is not only a give back of meals, but it also employs artisans in that country. So we have bags, we have bracelets, we have scarves. Um, our holiday campaign with new products is online right now. <laughs> um, Plug. For all of your uh, gifting needs. Um, so we are, if there is a threshold um, that we are going to be giving in dollar and meal amount, we are able to then earmark and create certain collections. Um, but we definitely, you know, started out as a global giving company. And we heard definitely in the past five years, why aren't you giving here in America? You know, there's a great need here right in our backyards. We knew this. Um, we had a little bit of a challenge um, working in schools here, which our model is to give school meals um, because of government issues. And so our initial outing, we did a partnership with The Gap, and we were able to give back through donorschoose.org. So whenever you made a donation, you could get industrial-sized blenders and refrigerators, grow organic gardens, but it wasn't that school meal program. 
Um, but then we decided we really needed to do something big in America because not a backlash, but people were saying, we really, really want to activate and engage here. So we partnered with Feeding America on the Target initiative and were able to give back. So that's something that will continue. Um, but it is disheartening. I mean, we've had people say to us, you know, when we wanted to work in Haiti um, a year after um, the disaster that happened there, we have people say to us, that story's over. People don't want to hear about that anymore. And it's just disheartening. And I mean, it gives me chills now because you know that the need is so great. So what we can do um, as far as earmarking and continuing to say these places need to be spotlighted, whether it is a product, whether we are asking our donor partners to really focus on that area, or if it's just the storytelling. We aren't necessarily saying that we're giving back directly through this bag, but continuing to keep those countries in the spotlight. Um, Sahel last year, same thing. We created videos and a campaign surrounding that. Not all of our proceeds were going there, but we just needed people to be activated in that space and in that region. This question is for Anjali, but I would also be curious to hear other thoughts. You all talked about the need to create a conversation in order to create a community with your consumers. When your model, like Warby Parker's, is a, bit, is a little bit complicated, it's not just that you're giving away eyeglasses, it's that you're training people to give eye exams, things like that. How do you make sure that the conversation with consumers is an informed one and people fully understand what they're talking about when they're talking about and with your brand? Um, it's a great question, thank you. The, you know, most of the conversation, frankly, is about the glasses, so you know, or about uh, a playlist that we might recommend to launch a new collection, or a reading list that we might, you know, put out there. So a lot of the conversation that we have with our consumers is around the lifestyle aspect of our brand, as opposed to the buy a pair, give a pair, or or the like. And um, part of so part of it is through some targeted emails. So when we reached our big milestone this summer of distributing 500,000 pairs of glasses. Um, we did a targeted email to our customers sort of celebrating that, and there was a lot of information in that messaging explaining the partnership and a video that went along with it explaining the partnership. And I think you know, we had the highest open rates of any of our emails on that particular campaign, which was really interesting. Um, so there's, there's those opportunities, but you know, I think that's still an ongoing challenge of thinking how do, we, how do we get people to dig deeper, because I think it's a very simplistic message you know, like we were talking about the sort of bumper sticker or bite-sized messaging of buy a pair, give a pair, and people will have an assumption of what that means. I think part of our challenge is to get people to look deeper. And so if you have any ideas, let me know. I mean, I think we're, we're trying to figure that out and see how deep do we go and, and where else should we provide that messaging, if at all. But we do other things in terms of our nonprofit stuff, too. You know, so we have our nonprofit product collaborations. You mentioned DonorsChoose.org. That was one of ours this past summer um, where we designed a special limited edition pair of glasses to benefit that organization. And so we are able to use our brand, you know, kind of spotlight or megaphone and shine it onto an organization like Donors Choose. And so we've, we've created those conversations with our consumers because I think they get very excited about those collaborations and people you know, get very connected to the nonprofits that we're highlighting in those instances. So we've done things like that as well. So again, as I said, it's not really just about buy a pair, give a pair. It's, it kind of goes all across the company. I'm not sure if that answers your question. But. Can I just say, for when, when we were running uh, Vivavi, the furniture company, we had a different point of view, which was, um, we're gonna, this company is about an aesthetic, where yes, everything is sustainable we, that we carry, at least by our definition, but we are not really going to lead with that. Um, what we will do, and in fact, we will have very, very short copy with things that are clickable, and the feeling was we will let folks who want to go deeper go deeper, mm -hmm. but we are here to make a sale mm -hmm. um, because by virtue of making a sale, that equates to we are doing something better right? For uh, based on our values. Um, and so we never felt like we needed to or, or even wanted to really put it out there in, in, a, in a super explicit way. Um, give it to those who want to go after it, but let those who just want to buy a beautiful coffee table get it fast. Yeah. That, and that's very similar to ours. Yeah. yeah. And before even working at Feed, coming from a fashion marketing background, I was struck by just how easily understandable the business model for Feed was. And this past August, we all went on a giving trip to Kenya and Rwanda. And when we were at one of the schools that we support in Kibera, one of the largest slums in Kenya, 
Um, you go, it's disheartening, but then you start talking to the children and playing with them, and I found myself surrounded by a group of eight and nine-year-old boys, and they were asking me a million questions about America, and am I married, and do I have children, <laughs> and I'm wearing a Feed 2 bag, and all of a sudden they say to me, um, how much does that bag cost? So you think, oh God, I'm about to say this is a $130 bag and I'm shilling to them, and this could cover what for them? What would this mean to them? So I told him and then immediately followed it up and said, um, but you know, our company sells these bags and they cost this amount of money, flipped it over because this one bag will feed two kids in school for a year. Pause, but then immediately he said, you should charge more. <laughs> because then you can feed more kids. And these are, you know, eight, nine year old kids in Kibera. So I said, if you know, this is translating here, it can translate anywhere, and that really is, I think, um, helpful for all of us in this space. It's a great story. <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah, a couple more hands. So a lot of the brands on the table now are newer and nimble and um, really don't have the baggage that some older, bigger brands carry in trying to shift a business model and tell these kinds of stories. So I'm wondering what advice you would have for more of a, a bigger heritage brand that, from the lessons that you've learned in, in building your businesses. Um, I mean, I, I could answer that one. <laughs> Partner with Feed. <laughs> The, yeah, the, the dinosaurs of the economy um, need to make a, respons a responsible uh, contribution to the solution as well. And it's a really interesting question you ask. And it's one that we've been um, working with Fortune 10 companies all the way to uh, partners like Feed on how do you how do you respond? How do you acknowledge that um, the values of, of consumerism is shifting and our brand needs to be in step with uh, what is important to the audiences that you serve? I think one of the biggest challenges that big, old, uh, established brands have is they have a built-in, uh, you know, flight or fight, and most of the time they flight and to survive, and, and there's a tradition and a history in, in these big organizations of hiding in the shadows around philanthropy and hiding in the shadows around um, responsibility. They just assume do it to be compliant. Uh, they do it because um, they have a vehicle called a foundation and so it gets done, um, but it's not, in the transparency of the world that we live in now, um, they need to come forward on the stage and participate in the conversation just like everybody else. And it's a very interesting period. Um, Gary talked about um, you know, a, a connection of leadership that goes back to the 1960s and there's a, a phenomenon of a CEO legacy now about what do I leave? What does this company really stand for? And you're now beginning to see organizations uh, begin to pay attention to uh, where the gravity of sentiment is now beginning to shift. Um, but they're hard, big, bureaucratic, institutionalized entities. They're not organizations with 10 or seven people in them. But they have to think that way. And, and to Gary's point earlier, you have to make people change the way they think before they're going to change the way they act. Mm -hmm. And any of us that are working with large corporations know that that's a headwind that we face every single day in every single conversation. This um, uh, reluctance to change is a phenomenon that exists in just virtually every large corporation in this country. And we have a responsibility collectively to chisel away that uh, inertia that exists and bring um, some enlightenment to those organizations. I would just, there's one example of, um, a, you, you mentioned heritage brand and um, I'm wearing Pendleton uh, from head to toe and that's uh, a over 100 year old heritage brand um, here on, in the West Coast. And 
they had a bold move, which was um, they wanted to bring some of their production back uh, from overseas to domestic production in Oregon. Uh, and so they started that with their um, Portland collection, which is what I'm wearing. Um, and it was, a, you know, it was a risky move for them, a really old company. Um, and they started with this, the, this younger collection. And it's, it's been killer. Like, everything has totally sold out. People are so excited about that brand. Um, and it was because they did something bold. They did something different. They reworked their like classic designs um, and, and had it work for a younger generation. And it's like people are really, really responding to it. So it was a, it was a good payoff for them for taking a risk and, and bringing something um, back home. Yeah, can I just say, I, I, I've just seen um, uh, a couple of different examples as well where I, I would argue that in today's world, the, the risk is, I think, again, you, t depending on what your goal is and who your stakeholder is, if you're saying we got to go message this to a consumer and get a consumer to care, right, that's different than an investor or a regulator or whomever else. But when you think about, or your employees, right, but if you, um, uh, I was talking once with a brand manager for uh, Hellman's Mayonnaise, and I think you know, Unilever um, has a ton of sustainability initiatives. Um, and this guy who was the brand manager said, look, you know, we spent two years trying to figure out, like we were told, go make this more sustainable. <laughs> we did a ton of testing, ton of testing. What could we do? You know, we're helmet where this brand's been around forever. And we hit on this idea that what we could do um, and what would resonate with consumers after a lot of research was uh, cage-free eggs. Right, so this is the step that we introduce, and now we're like, it, you know, Hellman's, I believe, I don't know if it's just one line or it's the whole brand, but cage-free eggs, right? And then they also said, and the good news is we can actually charge more because now it's more of a premium product, and, sure. but like those things align, and I think it was really focused on a consumer. The other thing I saw was really quirky, and it did play to the internet, was like Intel has this guy, they've got these videos on their site, um, you know, Intel does crazy awesome things for energy efficiency and projects around the world, amazing, but they've got this guy who's basically like a fanatical, if that's a word, fanatic, fanatical, uh, uh, recycler. Like, he's crazy. And he, he's out in Arizona, and he just, like, they make these videos of him, like, recycling everything or taking things out of dumps. And, and it really personalizes a huge brand um, in a very interesting way. It's risky because they're, you know, they're, you know, I mean, Intel, but uh, mm -hmm. it works. I've been very encouraged. I work on partnerships at Feed, um, and we've been able to uh, collaborate with Disney, uh, Whole Foods, Gap, Pottery Barn, Target over the years. Um, and I've been seeing just in my over two years at Feed, first on partnerships, people were wanting to come in for that quick fix. So you always have to be very aware, is this good washing? What are their intentions? Do we really align? Um, but now, a couple of years later, I'm seeing the partnerships that are coming in, they're wanting a long-term partnership. They're wanting and requesting three to five year contracts, which is wonderful because they really see this as a big part of their initiative that needs to translate corporate-wise um, and then also globally. Um, one of our uh, strongest partners is Clarence, which we've been working with them for three years. They started out in the first year um, having a goal of a million meals and we're already over 3.5 million meals. So that's a, you know, a partner that's a huge global brand that has really gotten behind this and we're going to take it international, but we're seeing more of people um, you know, not wanting just that one-off quick cost marketing fix, which is encouraging. That's a great note to end on. Um, the what is so encouraging and obviously uh, inspiring is um, the ability to have a much larger shadow that you cast in terms of uh, providing alternatives, in terms of uh, creating a dialogue with the marketplace that uh, it, it its essence is um, about truth and about um, commitment and about responsibility and yeah you become a beacon for other brands to draft off of you to learn from you so I on the one hand I I sit in homage and um, I uh, respect and and really do truly uh, feel uh, grateful for your presence in t telling us the stories um, you are truly the Don Quixotes of, um, of, of a new commerce, which is uh, introducing different business uh, <laughs> concepts and, and uh, models and, and being able to legitimately broadcast the success of your organizations. And so all of us who uh, deep down are entrepreneurs that um, don't want to work for the boss and 
feel like you're making a difference, um, you give us all encouragement and hope. And I thank you for your morning and thank you for your comments. Thank you. Thank you.